It was a blistering hot afternoon in the deep, humid backcountry of Tifton, Georgia, the kind of heat that makes the air feel thick enough to chew and the kind of dampness that rots wood faster than you can paint it, where a man named Keith Rucker stood staring at a pile of dying history that everyone else had already given up on. To the locals driving by on the dusty country road, the structure looked like nothing more than a heap of gray weathering, timber that had been beaten into submission by a hundred years of relentless rain, and baking sun, a sad remnant of the pioneer days that was clearly destined for a bulldozer or a matchstick. But Keith saw something different in those sagging logs and that crumbling roof. He saw the craftsmanship of ghosts, the sweat of the ancestors who had hewn those beams by hand and he felt a heavy sinking. Responsibility to save it before the Georgia mold turned the whole thing into compost. The problem was that the cabin was too fragile to move and too far gone for a simple patch job, because every time the rain fell, it soaked into the heart of the wood, and every time the sun came out, it boiled the moisture deeper into the fibers, creating a cycle of decay that no amount of varnish could ever stop. Keith had an idea that was so radical, so visually jarring, and so completely out of left field that when he first started telling people about it, they didn't just scratch their heads, they laughed right to his face and told him he was ruining the very landscape he claimed to love. He didn't want to just fix the roof or replace a few logs. He wanted to build an entirely new building over the old one, a massive, industrial-grade steel shell that would swallow the cabin hole like a ship in a bottle protecting it forever from the elements that were trying to kill it. He went out and purchased a massive steel kit, a structure often compared to the famous Quonset huts of World War II. Because of its arched rib-like construction and its ability to span huge distances without needing support columns in the middle, the neighbors watched in total confusion as the massive delivery truck arrived, dumping piles of curved steel beams and sheets of corrugated metal onto the grass next to the fragile little wooden house. The gossip in town was brutal and immediate, with people whispering that Keith had finally lost his mind, saying that he was going to turn a beautiful piece of rustic history into an ugly metal warehouse, and that he was building a monstrosity that would look like an airplane hangar had crash-landed on top of a pioneer homestead. They couldn't understand the physics of what he was trying to do, nor could they see the vision of the double roof system he was engineering in his mind where the outer shell would take the beating of the sun and the rain, while the inner cabin rested in a perpetual shaded sanctuary. As Keith began to pour the concrete footings, digging deep into the red Georgia clay to anchor the massive steel ribs, the skepticism hung in the air, heavier than the humidity. He was working alone or with just a few friends, sweating through his shirt, wrestling with heavy steel while the community drove by, slowed down, pointed fingers, and shook their heads at the crazy man who was burying a log cabin inside a metal tomb. But Keith didn't care about the aesthetics of the outside world because he knew that if he didn't act now there wouldn't be a cabin left to argue about in five years, so he kept driving the bolts and lifting the arches driven by a stubborn belief that he could create a mic microclimate that would defy the laws of nature. The stakes were incredibly high because the cost of the steel was significant, the labor was backbreaking, and if his theory about airflow and temperature regulation was wrong, he would have just built the world's most expensive oven, cooking the cabin to death instead of saving it. As the first giant steel arch rose into the sky, casting a long strange shadow over the rotting wood, the project passed the point of no return, and the mystery of whether this industrial beast would kill or cure the historic home began to tighten everyone's chest. No one knew yet that the gap between the steel and the wood would create a thermal phenomenon so powerful it would leave engineers baffled. If you want to see the actual moment, the neighbors stopped laughing and started staring in awe. Make sure you subscribe and hit that like button, because the engineering miracle that happens next is something you have to hear to believe. The construction phase was a logistical nightmare that would have broken a less determined man because building a massive steel cathedral over a fragile existing house is like trying to build a ship inside a glass bottle without shattering the glass. Keith had to erect the steel arches of the Quonset-style structure with surgical precision, ensuring that not a single heavy beam swung too low and smashed into the brittle chimney or the rotting eaves of the log cabin below. It was a high-wire act of heavy machinery and delicate preservation, where one slip of the crane or one miscalculation in the measurements could bring the entire historic structure crashing down in a cloud of dust and splinters. Day after day, Keith and his small crew battled the elements fighting against sudden thunderstorms that turned the construction site into a mud pit and gusts of wind that turned the large steel sheets into giant metal, sails that threatened to slice through anything in their path. The most critical part of the design was the air gap a calculated empty space between the old wooden roof of the cabin and the new steel. Sealing of the Quonset, which Keith insisted was the secret weapon that would control the temperature and humidity. Critics still claimed that the steel building would trap heat like a greenhouse, turning the cabin into a sauna and accelerating the rot with trapped moisture and stale air. But Keith was banking on a principle known as the chimney effect or passive convection, believing that if he left the ends of the steel building open or properly ventilated, the superheated air hitting the steel would rise and pull cooler air in from the bottom creating a constant, natural breeze that would wash over the cabin day and night. 
The work was grueling involving thousands of bolts that had to be hand-tightened and there were days when Keith looked at the monstrous metal skeleton caging the tiny wooden house and wondered if he had made a terrible expensive mistake. As the steel skin was finally laid over the skeleton, the cabin disappeared from view, hidden away inside the dark, echoing belly of the metal beast, and to the outside world. It looked exactly as bad as they had feared a giant, cold, industrial shed sitting in the middle of a green pasture. The ridicule from the town reached its peak with people joking that Keith was building a bunker for the apocalypse or that he was trying to hide something completely missing the genius of what was happening inside that dark space. Inside the structure, however, the atmosphere was already changing. The oppressive, blinding glare of the Georgia sun was gone, replaced by a cool, permanent shadow that felt instantly different on the skin. The ground, which had been baked hard by the sun, began to cool down, and the timber of the cabin, which had been scorching hot to the touch for decades, finally began to relax into the ambient temperature of the shade. The true test was approaching fast as the seasons began to turn, bringing with them the erratic and violent weather swings that the region was famous for, from freezing damp nights to sudden heat spikes. Keith set up thermometers and hygrometers, monitoring the data like a scientist in a lab, waiting to see if his crazy idea would actually stabilize the environment or if he had just created a mold factory. The tension was palpable because the wood of the cabin was so old that it had lost much of its natural resistance. It was like an old man with a compromised immune system needing a perfect environment to survive. He spent long nights inside the steel shell, listening to the rain hammer against the metal roof like machine gun fire, a sound that was deafeningly loud but essentially music to his ears because he knew that for the first time in a century, not a single drop was touching the cabin. The physical labor was done, but the waiting game had just begun, and the thermometer was about to reveal a truth that would silence every critic in the county. You won't believe the numbers that started showing up on Keith's sensors during the first freeze. Comment down below if you think a piece of metal can really change the temperature by over 50 degrees. The vindication of Keith Rucker didn't come with a speech or a parade, but with a brutal winter freeze that descended on Georgia with a biting ferocity that shocked the entire state, the temperature outside plummeted, dropping well below freezing, turning the water troughs to solid ice and sending the local residents scrambling to crank up their heaters and pile wood into their fireplaces. It was the kind of penetrating cold that usually seeps through the cracks of old log cabins, making them feel like iceboxes regardless of how big the fire is burning in the hearth. But inside, Keith's crazy steel quonset. Something miraculous and scientifically fascinating was happening that defied the expectations of everyone who had laughed at him. Keith walked out into the freezing morning, his breath visible in the biting air, and stepped through the large doors of the steel shell, instantly feeling a shift in the atmosphere that was so dramatic, it felt like stepping into a different latitude. The data from his sensors told a story that was almost impossible to believe. While the outside world was shivering in the low teens in single digits, the air pockets surrounding the cabin, and the thermal mass of the protected ground, held a temperature that was drastically higher. The 55 degrees wasn't just a random number, it represented the massive differential in stabilization he had achieved when the sun hit the steel roof, the air didn't bake the cabin, and when the frost hit the ground, the heat stored in the dry earth under the shed radiated up, keeping the cabin in a comfortable preservation zone. Specifically, on days when the sun blazed and the outside temperature would swing wildly, the interior of the cabin remained rock steady, sometimes maintaining a difference of huge magnitude compared to the surface temperature of the roof. The 55 degrees more heat referred to the ability of the system to retain the earth's warmth and shield against the wind chill factor that stripped heat away from every other house in the valley. The neighbors who had mocked the project eventually came by to see what was happening, and when they walked from the biting wind into the calm, still air of the steel enclosure, their skepticism evaporated instantly. They touched the logs of the cabin and found them bone dry and cool, not damp or frozen, realizing that Keith had essentially stopped time for the structure. The wood, which had been on the verge of turning to dust, was now stable. The rot had completely halted because the moisture content had dropped to perfect preservation levels. The crazy metal tent was acting like a giant lung, breathing hot air out and keeping the temperate air in utilizing the thermal mass of the shaded ground to act as a natural battery of warmth in the winter and coolness in the summer. Keith Rucker's project became a legend in the restoration community, proving that sometimes you have to do something that looks ugly or insane to achieve something beautiful and lasting. He had saved the history of his region not by following the rules of traditional restoration, but by applying industrial physics to a pioneer problem. The cabin now stands there, safe and sound inside its steel bodyguard a testament to the fact that the best way to preserve the past is to sometimes cover it up with the future. The 55-degree swing, the difference between the freezing death outside and the stable life inside was the ultimate mic drop to the haters. If you love seeing history saved by pure American ingenuity, share this story with a friend who loves old cabins, and let me know in the comments. Would you live in a house inside a house?